this nightmare of alienation and solitude. Whoops! <laughs> Careful with the furniture. I'm sorry. Remember, it's public property. I'm sorry. Just that there's a little business I'd like to discuss with you about the old woman, the pawnbroker who was killed. I see. Uh, well, sit down. Well, the fact is, she had one or two things of mine, and I'd like to inquire about reclaiming them. All you have to do is send us a written statement. He knows. I'm sorry to trouble you with such trifles. It's just that the silver watch was the only thing of my father's we had left. If my mother thought it was lost, I'm sure she'd be in despair. Women. I'm sure your things are quite safe. As I said... Was it all right? Did I overdo it? What did I say? Women. You see, I've been expecting you here for some time. The old woman wrote down the names of all of her clients, and uh, you're the only one who hasn't found it necessary to come forward. I'm afraid I haven't been very well. Yes, I heard that. Still look rather pale. No, I don't. I'm fine now. Anyway, this is ridiculous. I'm wasting your time. Good heavens, though, on the contrary. No, I, I find it fascinating to look and listen. I know. I'll get some tea. Might be a minute. He's just calmly spitting in my face. Maybe I'll blurt out everything. Right in your ugly mug. Then you'll see how I despise you. But what if I'm imagining it? God, I'm all nerves. They've got no facts. That's the main thing. That won't do, gentlemen. Give me facts. Oh, I've got the most terrible hangover. <laughs> I went to a party last night. Everybody was tanked up on punch and holding forth on the subject of is there such a thing as crime or not? Why not? It's an ordinary social question. It all brought to mind an article of yours which I had the pleasure of reading in the periodical magazine a couple of months ago. My article? I didn't know they published it. My dear fellow, it's a fact. As far as I remember, I dealt with the psychology of a criminal during the whole course of his crime. Mm, yes. It was the end of the piece that interested me. Where you hint at the existence of certain people who actually have the right to commit all sorts of enormities and are, as it were, above the law. Not exactly. I think I argue that the really extraordinary people, the Napoleons and Mohammeds and so on, demanded the destruction of the present in the name of a better future. If for the sake of that idea a man has to step over a corpse, or wade through blood, then in my opinion, he's absolutely entitled. I see. But how are we to distinguish the extraordinary people from the ordinary ones? Don't you think they ought to introduce a special uniform? Wear a badge or be branded in some sort of way? Be a bit frightening if a misunderstanding should arise. Suppose, for instance, uh, a young man decides that he's a Napoleon and uh, decides to, well, step over an obstacle. See what I mean, don't you? It could happen. Vain and stupid people might fall into that trap. Well, what about it? Well, what about it? It's not my fault, is it? You've got your prisons, your police, your magistrates. So catch your thief. <laughs> what if we do catch him? Serves him right. Hmm. You're logical at any rate. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I can't resist just asking you one more oh, a little question. All right, what is it? It's a rather amusing idea, a psychological one. I mean... When you were writing your article, you couldn't possibly have thought that, no, <laughs> that you, you yourself were just a, a wee bit of a, an extraordinary man, could you? Quite possibly. I'm sorry, I, I didn't really mean it, of course. I was merely interested from a literary point of view, uh, just to make sure that I understood your article. My God. How obvious and insolent that is. Hunter and Hunted. The scenes with the examining magistrate Porphyry are among the most gripping in the whole book. 
And while Raskolnikov is circling round his interrogator, he's also circling round himself, hunting himself down, trying to make sense of what he's done. Here, we're not in search of a culprit, we're in search of a motive. And in trying to make sense of what he's done, Raskolnikov tries all kinds of explanations, from I decided to get hold of the old woman's money, to I wanted to dare, that was my only motive. And even I just did it. Dostoevsky was anxious, in his own words, to explain the murder one way or another. But his genius wouldn't let him. His genius told him that we are endlessly mysterious to ourselves, that what we call reasons are often just rationalizations, that we're capable of thinking one thing but doing another without knowing why. The single straightforward reason for the murder is something that never arrives. The whole book is the reason. I wanted to become a Napoleon. That's Raskolnikov's favorite among his many attempts, his many versions of his reason for having done what he has done. Power waits the really extraordinary man who is prepared to stoop and grab that power. This is Raskolnikov at his most demonic. It anticipates Nietzsche, certainly, and even 20th century fascism. But the small man who only thinks he's a Napoleon is just a clown.